you for having me. I really appreciate uh, Eric arranging this visit and the hospitality that everyone in the department has shown. Uh, it's really been terrific to be here, and it was an added bonus to have the familiar face of John Click a few years after the last time I saw him. Um, so yes, my topic today is anti-democracy, uh, and the essential uh, purpose of the paper is to study the institution of plebiscites from a social choice perspective. A little bit of background here. This project came about because of the book that Eric uh, referred to. In October, I published a book that I co-authored with Todd Zawicki called Public Choice Concepts and Applications in Law. That's the book that I'm teaching public choice uh, with here, and it's great because I've got a mix of law students and uh, economic students, and it's really been a lot of fun, although since I gave the midterm last night, I'm not sure the students necessarily agree at this juncture that it's been quite as much fun as I've found it. Uh, but the, uh, in, the, in the book, we had a section on direct democracy, and my co-author, who is probably more like-minded with Eric than with me, uh, he and I had really profound disagreements on the wisdom and efficacy of the institution of direct democracy, the consequence of which, as had been the case in a few other critical parts of the book, uh, the consequence of which was that the direct democracy section of the book was heavily negotiated, uh, which, um, since I'm a student of Supreme Court opinions, uh, I find an interesting process. And the difficulty with negotiated drafting is it never says anything terribly interesting, um, which is why separate opinions are always much more interesting to read than the opinions written for a group, like for a court. Um, and so I took the opportunity to, uh, to, to sort of write what I actually thought on direct democracy, which resulted in the paper that I'm going to present, uh, present to you now. I should also say it's great to be here on this Friday the 13th. Um, always a good time to give a talk, especially for the first time, which this <coughs> is, uh, although I will be presenting it at a couple of other venues, uh, Leanne's venues, uh, later on next week and the week after, which will be a lot of fun as well. So my argument in this paper is uh, sort of two-part. One is I'm simply making a positive claim or a descriptive claim. Uh, and the second part is a normative claim. Uh, the positive descriptive claim is that plebiscites are anti-democratic in a social choice sense. I'm going to demonstrate to you that counterintuitively, when you study the institution of plebiscites from a social choice perspective, it has the requisite characteristic features that we ascribe to anti-democratic rather than to democratic institutions. That's the purely descriptive component of the piece. But I think in some respects, in this case, um, the descriptive part might be more counterintuitive and maybe a little more controversial than the normative part. Uh, and the normative part is I sort of describe what I think are the appropriate contexts for plebiscite decision making versus representative legislative decision making. I think that's less controversial because a lot of people have ultimately taken the normative view that I take, but they don't ground it in the methodological approach that I demonstrate. And one of the reasons why I thought this project important is because, um, as we'll see in a second, there is an enormous literature on direct democracy. It's one of the most written about areas uh, that I can identify in the American Law Review, um, in the American Law Review um, journals, and there are strongly competing claims, and I'm going to put some up uh, in a moment, on both sides, almost directly contradictory claims. And one of the difficulties with that is that when you look at the methodological approaches that are taken, it is often the case that it's founded upon conflicting normative premises, different methodological approaches, uh, sort of difficulties associated with testing these sorts of questions empirically. And it occurred to me that it would be helpful to have a methodological approach that could cut through a lot of this disagreement and come up with a common foundational basis for assessing the relevant institutions, and I'll describe that in a couple of minutes. So in a kind of David Letterman sense, I'm going to give you sort of the top ten thoughts about direct democracy from the very, very large number of articles that I've read on the subject, starting with five on the arguments for direct democracy, and then I'll give you five against direct democracy. Um, those who favor direct democracy have said, number one, it has a tendency to limit agency slack 
between constituents and their legislative agents. So uh, basically, the electorate is able to rein in, in effect, the legislators by actually having a direct say through direct democracy. Second, um, John Matsusaka, who's done some empirical work, has demonstrated that, uh, it, that, that um, sovereignties that have direct democracy in some form tend to operate in a more streamlined fashion, and we could roughly equate that with efficiency, although there may be some baseline questions there, but it does seem to be the case that direct democracy correlates with certain aspects of streamlined government operations. One specific example Matsusaka points out is that states that have direct democracy tend to prefer fee-for-service provision of government largesse over general tax revenue-based uh, provision of government largesse, and that seems to support the second intuition that he also uh, claims. Um, the, third, the fourth is that direct democracy uh, facilitates structural reforms that legislators often are unwilling to enact for self-interested reasons. Things like term limits, things like controls on gerrymandering and the like, you're far more likely to be able to control that through the institution of direct democracy than to essentially have um, have the legislators police their own wayward behavior. Um, and the last one, and in some respects the most interesting one, um, is that direct democracy, it is argued, better aligns policy with constituents' desires, constituent desires using as the baseline for analysis median electoral, pro uh, median electoral preferences along isolated policy dimensions that the plebiscite is targeted toward. So in other words, if we say that what we're trying to get a sense of is what would the electorate want to have done on this issue, and we use the notion of a median electoral voter as the proxy for what a majority of the electorate would want, direct democracy does a better job at accomplishing an alignment of policy with that baseline than does representative decision making. So those are the primary arguments that have been advanced in support of direct democracy. And on the other side, um, these again are primary arguments uh, linked to a whole bunch of articles uh, by, by, by quite prominent scholars writing in the field. The first one, and perhaps the one that gets the most attention, um, is the notion that a lot of these plebiscites, especially voter initiatives, versus, as opposed to referendums, and let me draw the distinction, Voter initiatives are essentially something that has been written outside the legislative process. The requisite number of signatures has been obtained. It's been balloted, okay? And then there will be a vote on it. Um, and that's an initiative. A referendum typically refers to a piece of legislation that has gone through the legislature and then is forwarded to a ballot for an up or down vote by the electorate. Referendum meaning referred in this sense. So uh, specifically when we're talking about initiatives, there has been uh, a substantial amount of scholarship on the poor quality of draftsmanship and the consequential voter confusion, the inability to actually get a handle on what it is the voters are actually deciding. Um, in addition, and this is a very prevalent argument in the literature, it's, uh, it's the case that plebiscites do not allow the kind of registry of intensities of preference that are commonplace in legislative processes, and I'll have more to say about that uh, when I get into the talk. Um, third, and this goes to the fifth uh, on, the, on the prior list, um, it, af it assumes a false premise about uh, what, a, what a proper normative justification is for policy change. The premise that we care about median electoral preferences along isolated policy dimensions is a contestable premise, and that again is something that I will come back to. Uh, number four, uh, and this actually, I should say, is listed as a separate item, but certainly links up to some of the others, and in particular number two. Um, it risks subordinating the interests of minorities who, as a matter of definition, are outnumbered in electoral uh, processes respecting matters that might be of particular concern to them. And fifth, and this goes to an article by two scholars, um, Thad uh, Kuser and Matthew uh, McCubbins, who I will spend a little bit of time talking about their work uh, in the article, because they actually uh, did write about it from a social choice perspective, and it's one of the few pieces that, that does so, but I have my disagreements with them. Um, they say that, that plebiscites risk embedding out, risks producing outcomes that embed cycles 
uh, or what they refer to as sequential elimination agendas, and I'll have more to say about that, and in addition, risks producing extreme policies as compared against the baseline of the median legislator. Um, and in fact, they demonstrate this, and these graphics are from their article, not from mine, although I reproduced them with attribution. The essential argument that Kusser and McCubbin makes, ah, I do have a nifty chance to use this pointer, if I can go back to the correct slide, um, is that if you use the, so here's your issue dimension, whatever the issue is, it's issue, issue K. This is your status quo. The F stands for floor median, so this is the median legislator. I stands for the electoral median, voter along the relevant issue spectrum. What they're saying is that if that's the configuration, the first, if this is your configuration, it's probably the case that it's not worth it to invest in the plebiscite process because you'll get enough of a payoff lobbying the legislature and you'll get a fairly significant move from SQ to F, although you don't get the move from F to I. Conversely, in this case where I is on the opposite side of F, you obviously, if you're motivated to move policy in the direction uh, to the right of SQ, you're not going to lobby the four median if you actually are the one sponsoring this uh, potential plebiscite. Instead, you're going to actually use the plebiscite process because you wouldn't get a favorable payoff in the legislature. And so from this, Kusser and McCubbins maintain that systematically, given the fairly high startup costs of getting plebiscites balloted and given the incentive structures, typically you end up with fairly dramatic changes through the plebiscite process if you accept their baseline, right? Just as we have a baseline problem with the median electoral voter, here we could have a quibble about their selection of the median floor voter in a legislature as the appropriate baseline, right? Both of these are contestable. Neither one of them is self-evident as the correct uh, baseline against which one should measure the proper uh, departure from the status quo. So in any event, um, the literature is, as I said, broad. It has a lot of contradictory uh, arguments in it. And what I uh, set out to do was to try to come up with a framework that would allow me to cut through a lot of these competing claims. And my argument is that ultimately this is a problem of social choice. Ultimately, it's a problem of how institutions go about making decisions. And it's very important to consider in effect, the implications of social choice for each of the relevant institutions under review. Now, obviously, one pair of compar one, one comparison that is almost too self-evident to state is we want to compare direct democracy as an institution to legislative decision making as an institution. And perhaps social choice can provide a vehicle that would edify that comparison. My somewhat more counterintuitive claim is that in fact to do this job effectively we need a three-way comparison. It's not enough to compare direct democracy to a legislative decision-making body. We have to also compare it to appellate court decision-making. And in fact, the better way to do it is to initially compare direct democracy to appellate judicial decision-making. And then after we have an understanding of the different dynamics of decision-making across those two institutions, we then can use them as a basis for studying direct democracy. Now that is counterintuitive, and you might say, well, why are you throwing in appellate courts? And there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that to the extent that we think that appellate courts are not the obvious alternative choice for policy making ab initio, in the absence of legislatures, we wouldn't say, okay, let's just appoint a bunch of czars and we'll call them appellate judges or Supreme Court justices or, or lords or whatever it is. Um, precisely because we sort of viscerally hold that view, that implies that there's something inherent about judicial decision making that seems, well, anti-democratic. And so one payoff is, if we can identify what it is about appellate courts that's different from legislative decision making, that makes it seem anti-democratic in, in contrast with legislative decision making, that in and of itself will be a valuable exercise. But in fact, there's a bigger payoff. It turns out that when we construct a social choice profile of representative legislation on the one side and appellate court decision making on the other, it turns out, counterintuitively perhaps, that direct democracy has the appellate judicial social choice profile. It does not have 
the representative legislative social choice profile. And that's the descriptive part of the paper. I'm going to demonstrate to you that institutionally, direct democracy looks like judicial decision making, not like representative lawmaking. And then the normative piece of the paper is, I think that has implications. I think it has implications for the job that we put to each institution as between representative lawmaking and, uh, and, um, and plebiscites. Okay, so we have to go back to first principles. For you folks, this is probably quite familiar, and, and, and please, don't, uh, please don't feel uh, insulted if I'm going through stuff that you folks know innately, but nonetheless, I don't assume this to be knowledge with which everyone's born, and not everybody who does e economics has spent recent time thinking about social choice. So we go back to some really basic principles, and this is the voter paradox. We have three people. Uh, they each hold transitive preference orderings over A, B, and C. Person one holds preferences A, B, C, two, B, C, A, three, C, A, B. Um, I say that they're individually transitive, so I assume from this that person one prefers A to C, two prefers B to A, th uh, three prefers C to B, right? So if I tell you, and I tell my students this all the time, uh, I prefer coffee ice cream to chocolate ice, cr ice cream to vanilla ice cream, that, by the way, is true, um, you would think it odd. If I told you I do, however, prefer vanilla ice cream to coffee ice cream, you would probably discount a lot of what I say thereafter uh, because you would think, well, this guy's a little bit off. The fact that I actually do prefer coffee to vanilla ice cream doesn't prove that I'm not off, but it does prove that at least along the dimension of internal transitivity, I satisfy the basic definition of rationality as an economist would use that term. So here we take the binary comparisons. There's no first choice winner, A against B. Everybody's assumed to vote sincerely. Persons one and three prefer A to B, so A wins. Then we take C, uh, who's left out against A. Persons two and three prefer C to A. C wins. So we know C is preferred to A is preferred to B. And the question is, does that imply, as it does for an individual like person three, does it imply that C is preferred to B? The basic voting paradox is no, it does not. If we take B, the option defeated in round one, resurrect it, pit it against C in round two, it turns out that B wins, so we end up with the cycle. A is preferred to B is preferred to C is preferred to A, which means that the group as a whole prefers coffee to chocolate to vanilla to coffee. Okay, so that's the cycle. Uh, fairly basic stuff. Um, of course, we also know it's not universal. We have to go no further than the late 1780s to see that that's true. Uh, the, the Marquis de Condorcet, before he lost his head to the guillotine, came up with a couple of interesting public, uh, public and social choice observations. Uh, and he said, okay, let's flip the second and third preference of uh, person three. So instead of CAB, it's CBA. Again, there's no first choice majority preference here. We do the same exercise, A against B. In this case, B wins. Um, with persons two and three preferring B to A. C against B, again, B wins, with persons one and two preferring B to C. We can have a contest between A and C. If we do, we're going to discover that C wins um, with persons two and three preferring C to A, but it's basically beside the point, because the bottom line is that B defeats each alternative in a direct peerwise comparison. Condorcet said the following. He said, look, in the absence of a first choice majority candidate, the option that defeats all others in direct comparisons should be regarded as best. And since he came up with this idea in writing first, it got named after him. It's called uh, the Condorcet, B is called the Condorcet winner. Rules that ensure that available Condorcet winners prevail is, are referred to as rules meeting the Condorcet criterion. So Condorcet's criterion is that if there's an available Condorcet winner, uh, the rule ought to select it. The problem, of course, is that, um, as we saw in the last slide, there isn't always going to be a Condorcet winner. One of the interesting things about Condorcet winning rules is that they invari there, there are a bunch of different ways you can, uh, you can structure the rules to satisfy Condorcet's criterion. And they all get you to the same place. If there is a Condorcet winner, they will all pick the Condorcet winner. Um, if there isn't a Condorcet winner, it ends up being a bit of a mess because you end up with a cycle ultimately being exhibited. The, 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 the interesting thing is that the Condorcet rules have to satisfy the following condition. They have to allow at least the same number of binary comparisons as options. If they don't allow the same number of binary comparisons as options, you end up with an outcome that depends on the path of voting. So essentially, if you limit, if you have n options but n minus 1 pairwise comparisons, 
then you want it, then, then you say, hey, the job I'd like is agenda setting. I'd like to be the one who gets to determine which votes take place. Again, assuming sincere voting, and, and I will come back to the issue of sincere voting a little bit later. I don't want you all to naively assume that I live in a world in which everybody is sincere all the time. I, I don't live in that world, and I don't think that the analysis that I'm gonna undertake would suggest that that world is relevant to all institutions. Okay, so that's the Condorcet, um, the Condorcet criterion. I should have said at the very outset, of course, ask questions at any point. Uh, don't hesitate, I'm happy to entertain questions all through. Um, and of course, at the end as well. So, Ken Arrow, in your list of, uh, you know, sort of the greats of economics who have won Nobel Prizes uh, in the early 50s, he comes up with this idea that he's gonna come up with a set of rules governing an institution that will satisfy uh, a series of conditions, one of which is rationality defined as the ability to guarantee transforming uh, transitive member inputs into collectively transitive outputs. So the black box, the institution, takes these transitive inputs, processes them somehow, guarantees that the outputs satisfy the notion of collective transitivity. They don't cycle. Um, so that's one aspect, that the institution has to be rational in that way. But the other aspect is that it has to satisfy a number of conditions that he associated with more or less fair democratic decision making. Another one of the greats in the hallway is William Vickray, uh, who took Arrow's somewhat complicated proof that actually turned out to be erroneous initially, and one of his colleagues down the hall demonstrated it to be erroneous initially, which is why social choice in individual values second um, is actually the one that you care about if you care about the mathematics of all this, because the first one had a mathematical error that it took Arrow about a year to fix. But nonetheless, um, William Vickery simplified his proof in a way that actually just makes this easier to present, but doesn't, uh, doesn't do any injustice to the fundamentals of Arrow's proof. And we can therefore narrow down the fairness conditions to four. Um, and the four conditions are range. Range I'm gonna spend a moment on uh, after I get through the rest of them. So I'm simply gonna read the definition and then I'll explain what it really means uh, in a moment. So don't worry about the fact that it's a sort of arcane wording. Uh, range says the outcome must be consistent with the member's ordinal rankings over three available options. Unanimity means essentially the Pareto criterion, but there's a little bit of a twist there. Um, moves from the status quo to an alternative state that benefit at least one person without harming the other must be taken. The twist on the Pareto criterion here is that it's institution specific. So you wouldn't want to assume that Arrow's assumption here is that all laws are efficient in the sense that they allow private market exchange to take place. You could have a Pareto move within a legislative body that blocks out unanimous exchange in the private market. It may be the case that legislators low ro roll logs in a way that prevents by holding uh, off limits certain kinds of private market transactions. So you can honor Pareto in the legislature or you can honor it in the private market. That's not a rule about Pareto, that's a constitutional rule, right? And my day job is teaching constitutional law. And in fact, that's, that, that's one of the reasons for the connection. The domain of contract is not proved by contract law. The domain of contract is proved by constitutional rules governing its domain. And you can have a constitutional rule that preserves the domain within the legislative body or alternatively in the private market. You cannot have a constitutional rule that preserves it in both. Eventually you will have a conflict where you'll have to make a constitutional level choice about whether a law restricting private market transactions is permissible or is ultra virus. We call it unconstitutional, right? But the point is that that's a meta level rule, that's not a contract rule. So it's important to understand that feature of the unanimity uh, criterion. Independence of irrelevant alternatives. It's actually, in some respects, the most contested of the fairness conditions in Arrow's theorem. Uh, it's basically the idea that you only vote sincerely when presented with binary comparisons. So your choice between A and B should be unaffected by the, con by the potential introduction later on of, uh, of C. Um, one of the reasons why it's contested is because a lot of people say, well, gee, um, if I am influenced by the later introduction of C, then obviously the later introduction of C was not irrelevant, definitionally, right? I was influenced by it, it mattered to me. But what, what Arrow's focusing on here, and also what Condorcet was focusing on here, were a couple of important things. Condorcet was influenced by essentially Rousseau's notion of republicanism and the idea that when you enter the room of public debate, you leave your private interests at the door and you simply assess 
what is best for society at large, and that's a merits comparison, not a strategic one. Arrow was worried about the difficulty of interpersonal utility comparison, so it's sort of influenced by neoclassical concerns. Um, so that's independence of relevant alternatives. The last one's non-dictatorship. It's sort of the most obvious, which is to say, if you want a fair democratic system of governance, you shouldn't systematically honor the preferences of one person against the contrary will of the rest of the group, right? Um, Seems pretty basic, except for the fact that what Arrow proved is that sometimes the only way you can get around all this stuff is to appoint a dictator, which is why it took 20 years for people of, of people trying to prove him wrong to actually prove that, well, gee, unfortunately he's not wrong. Well, unfortunate for people trying to prove him wrong, but pretty good for him uh, because he ended up getting this big prize in 1972. Uh, for proving that you know what I plan to do for my summer vacation didn't work out. I always tell my students that's a great story, right? You say this is what I'm, this is the project I'm planning to do, and you end up writing a paper about how you couldn't do it, right? Usually failure is just that. In this case, failure is success. It's kind of a nice, uh, nice ending uh, for a nice guy, I should say. Uh, Ken, Ken Arrow is a, is a is a very nice man. Um, <laughs> And I say that because I actually had, I had breakfast with him. I'm not a name dropper, but I had breakfast with him and it sort of actually substantively relates to something I'm going to say later on. Um, okay. So, range. I promised to explain range in English. Range. The outcome must be consistent with the member's ordinal rankings over three available options. What in the world does that mean? Here's what it means. You've got three options, A, B, and C. And I always say this to my students. I say, okay, how many ways are there to order options A, B, and C? And then I tell them there's a kind of smart way to figure this out and there's kind of a dumb, dumb way to figure this out. I don't care which one you use. How do you figure it out? And uh, almost invariably, somebody says three factorial. I said, bingo, that's the smart way to figure it out, right? For your first option, you've got three choices. You've now picked one. For your second, you've got two. You've now picked two. Third one, you've got three. This is as mathematical as I get in my public cho choice course. Three times two times one is six. And I insist that students be able to engage in that level of multiplication or they are not qualified to study public choice with me, but you can list them as well. And there's a benefit to doing it the dumb, dumb way, which is ABC, ACB, BAC, BCA, CAB, CBA. Okay. The benefit of the dumb, dumb way is that you can then easily demonstrate that there are two combinations over those three sets of ordinal rankings that can get you in trouble if your goal is to get to an outcome that's transitive. And so the essential idea is that if three people have free reign, remember what, remember what range says, that um, the outcome must be consistent with the member's ordinal rankings over three available options. They can choose any ordering that they want, and the output has to be consistent with their selection of any rank ordering. The problem is that if your three people choose A, B, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, that's referred to as a forward cycle, you can't guarantee a transitive outcome. And conversely, if they choose these three, C, B, A, B, A, C, A, C, B, which is a reverse cycle, same deal. So there are two sets of three ordinarily ranked preferences that are going to get you in trouble on rationality if you adhere to range. Cool. Yes? In what sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving that out. I, I am leaving out indifference, which, which makes it more complex. But I don't think it's going to undermine the ultimate analysis to do so. Yeah. You could introduce that, and then you'd have to do a few more maneuvers. But I don't think it's going to ultimately change where you go. Okay. Um, okay, so let, let me go back. So essentially, here, here's the, 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 the take-home point from, from all of this for the immediate purposes. Of course, there's a lot of take-home points from Arrow's theorem, which is why it generated one of the largest social choice literatures in existence. Yeah. Have you, have you yeah. The range criteria now? What's that? I, I am about, yeah, I, I have. Yeah, go ahead. Because uh, I still didn't get, well, I've got these two propositions, but the range criteria, where you're saying the output has to be uh, selection from one of those sets if, it, if, if those are the that you can't guarantee a transitive output if your member preferences yield a cycle. And so the problem is that if you allow your members, that's the point, if you allow your members to choose among any of those, there are two, combina there are two combined sets. So you're going to restrict that between them. Well, that's one possibility, right? One possibility is to restrict domain, right? Using Arrow's terminology. You can restrict domain, right? Here, here domain and range are kind of collapsed into one using Vickeray's formulation, but that's the basic idea. But I'm not making a normative posit about which one you want to get yet. Here, here's the point that I want to make. What Arrow's theorem proves 
is the inability simultaneously to satisfy rationality plus all the fairness conditions. What Arrow's theorem says nothing in particular about is which conditions, as among rationality or any of the fairness conditions, any given institution will actually sacrifice. So we can say the following. Any institution that functions, meaning it issues collective decisions, based on Arrow's theorem we know, is going to come up short against one of these conditions. Right? It's going to come up short either against rationality or one of the fairness criteria. But we don't know which one it will be. So debates about which are important or unimportant may actually frame the question wrong. In other words, it may not be a question of whether it's appropriate to relax domain, whether it's appropriate to relax independence. That may be the wrong question. The better question might be, what is the profile of different institutions? Because presumably different institutions will relax different criteria. And when we figure out why or how they relax different criteria, we can understand something about the dynamics of those different institutions. So what I'm trying to do here is to say, let's use Arrow's theorem as a positive tool rather than as a normative statement about what we want in an institution, let's simply recognize no institution meets all the criteria. So then let's use that as a profiling basis. And the benefit of doing that is, unlike a lot of the literature on direct democracy, I then have a common benchmark against which to compare all these institutions. I'm using the same language. I'm using the same tools. And then I can make a more informed assessment about how direct democracy compares up against the alternative institutions that are relevant for analyzing it. So I'm going to now turn to the legislature. And I only have one slide in the legislature, but don't be misled. I have a bunch of slides on appellate courts and a bunch of slides on direct democracy. But the legislature is the easiest to sort of explain intuitively. Legislatures have a particular power that's an enormous power, which is legislatures have the power to remain inert. And they can remain inert under two sets of conditions. These are not exclusive. They can remain inert under other conditions. But there are two relevant sets of conditions under which they can remain inert. One is if they discern that the preferences of the members are such that there's no normative justification from changing from the status quo to a proposed alternative state. That could happen, for example, if you have cycling preferences. If they discover a cycle, then there isn't a normative justification for moving forward because each proposal is actually disfavored by a majority relative to an alternative proposal. Essentially, you're in an empty core situation using the game theoretical framing, but it's the same basic idea. Now, now, in addition, it is quite possible that there's a Condorcet winner, but that when you register intensities of preference, you discover you don't want to make the move to the Condorcet option because aggregate utility will actually be negative. Despite the fact that there's a Condorcet winner available, that doesn't account for intensities of preference. The two limits of Condorcet's criterion are number one, there isn't always a Condorcet winner. Number two, even when there is a Condorcet winner, the Condorcet criterion, which is founded on majority rule, just like majority rule, doesn't account for intensities of preference. And as a result, based either upon cardinal utility as opposed to ordinal rankings, just, once, just to finish the thought, or based upon the absence of a normative justification ranking preferences ordinally, the legislature has the ability to remain inert. Y can I just finish one more thought on the slide? And then, and then, yeah, just to finish this, because this, uh, there's, no, no, no. th there's one more critical point, and then, and then I'll be done with the legislature, and I'll take your question. Here's the basic idea. There's a huge public choice literature on legislatures that makes quite clear that legislative processes don't systematically use Condorcet-type rules. The literature is replete with examples of things like veto gates or negative legislative checkpoints. That's McNoll-Gast and me. I'm the one who came up with that other term, which I wouldn't have. We published at the same time. Um, limits on reconsideration of defeated alternatives. That's a classic range-restricting rule, limiting the number of options relative to number of votes relative to options. Or using uh, Shepsley and Weingast framing, structure-induced equilibrating rules. Rules that simply make it more difficult in a formal way to discern whether member preferences cycle. My point, however, is even when legislative rules formally raise the cost of discovering preferences that either cycle or instances in which cardinal utility would be negative when we take intensities into account, 
That doesn't mean that legislative processes disallow members to discover cycling preferences or the presence of unequal utilities. And that's because legislative processes are often the final decision point for information and decisions that have been made logically antecedent to the formal vote. In other words, legislators routinely discover information outside the form formal voting rules, and they use that information, for example, to derail threatened agendas and voting paths that take them to a place that only the agenda setter and a minority want to go. In effect, the idea is that legislators have the ability to discover what the relevant preferences are and, critically, to act on them by considering future agendas when making present decisions. So to summarize this, using Arrow's theorem, what this combines to demonstrate is that legislators have the ability to remain inert, meaning they adhere to range. If they discover that, in fact, the aggregate preferences are such that there's no normative justification for moving forward, they can let bills die. And in fact, in the US Congress, the overwhelming majority of bills die. They get locked up in committee. They get locked up in subcommittees. Almost you know, a, a minuscule percentage of bills actually get to a floor vote. And in addition, legislators routinely vote in a manner that thwarts Erovian independence. They don't systematically vote sincerely. So the profile of a legislature is it adheres to range, but it relaxes independence of irrelevant alternatives. The fix for legislatures is relaxing independence, allowing legislatures, legislators to actually not vote sincerely. I say this to my students all the time. If a candidate for Congress in your district runs on the following platform, I promise never to vote insincerely. Is that good? Is that somebody for whom you want to vote? And it forces my students to think very carefully because they realize, yeah, they, they would like, they, they'd like to associate with people that are sincere, but do you want that kind of person representing you in Congress? Maybe not so much, right? That's not necessarily something that rewards your interests. Okay, Eric, I'm sorry, go ahead. Right. Right. Um, well, and yes and no. Yeah. 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 But it's too yeah. It is a potential solution, but you can still end up with other problems. Well, it depends. Again, let me be clear about that. Let me be clear about that. There's no doubt that Shepsley and Weingast are correct that structure-induced equilibrating rules can result in path-induced outcomes. No doubt that legislative rules matter to outcomes. I'm not suggesting by this argument that they don't. What I am suggesting is when stakes are maybe not as high, then you may end up with a lack of incentives to invest in discerning the information that would yield either you know, so there's information that there's a cycle or information that preference intensities are all that strong that it's not worth going with the Condorcet winner. But when the stakes are sufficiently high, legislators will work around rules that formally limit things like reconsideration of defeated alternatives. That's the point that I'm trying to make. In other words, when stakes are high enough, legislators have the wherewithal to go around the rules to discover things. And also, let me just be also clear about this, because a lot of people um, sort of have a misunderstanding about the, the point about cycling. I am not <coughs> suggesting that members of Congress or of the New Zealand Parliament sit around and say, oh, turns out you all prefer A to B to C. You prefer B to C to A, and those folks prefer C to A to B. We're cycling. Let's close shop. What I am suggesting is it is possible that they discover that for any option that's floated, there seems to be enough opposition not to go forward. In other words, they don't have to think about all of the conceivable rank orderings to discover, well, this doesn't seem to work. This doesn't seem to work. This doesn't seem to work. None of these work. Let's go on to a different business item. In other words, it may be less formal, and it may be incomplete segments of the ordinal rankings that they discover to make their decision not to go forward. But the consequence is that when there's a, something that sort of correlates with an empty core game, 
members of the legislature have the wherewithal to actually treat it as such. That's the point that I'm trying to make. I, I just always thought of it as less, less being that everybody would oppose some move from the status quo, but rather that whatever move you make from the status quo would have some other move adopted. But that's right. But the point is that you don't have to make the move, right? Yes, the path dependence is a possibility, and we're going to see how it manifests itself in various settings. What you're suggesting is that one possibility is not inertia, but simply path-dependent outcomes. And I'm not going to deny that in many legislative contexts you have path-dependent outcomes. I'm simply suggesting the fact that you have susceptibility path dependence doesn't mean you also don't have the wherewithal to avoid it when the stakes are high enough. That's the point. Those aren't inconsistent arguments, right? It's a question of stakes. If the stakes, because of the risk of the path, are so high, disadvantaged parties will figure it out and try to derail the path, either by voting strategically or coming up with a way to kill it. That's all I'm saying. Does, does that answer your question? No. Oh, we can come back to it. If, OK, so now, so, so that, so, so just to recap, the argument I'm making is when you go through the arrows criteria, the solution for the legislature is relax independence. Now, I'm going to, but adhere to range. The argument I'm going to make about appellate courts is that it is precisely the opposite profile in this sense. Appellate courts have an obligation to resolve properly documented cases without regard to the structure of judicial preferences. Meaning, whether or not judicial preferences cycle, they have to decide the case. They have to decide the binary choice, affirm or reverse. Second, appellate courts generally vote in a manner consistent with their sincerely held views. Now, I know that's going to generate opposition, but I will defend it. I will defend it. I, I, am, I, I have considerable thoughts about this point, and I, I will express them. But I know that people say, no, judges behave insincerely. But I want to be clear. I'm not making a posit about what informs their normative views. I'm saying whatever the normative views are, they could be bogus, they could be very well thought out. They have an incentive to vote consistently with those views. Um, and the, the, the consequence of that is that appellate judicial decision-making processes are median member rewarding. They tend to conduce toward outcomes that actually are consistent with the median preferences of the appellate court. Um, and a couple of examples that I'm going to illustrate are, uh, I'm going to give an example of what I mean by uh, an obligation to resolve cases, which means that range is relaxed. That's the implication. If the court has to decide a case even when preferences cycle, it means that they have to use a rule inconsistent with range. They have to limit domain in some way. And I'm also going to demonstrate why it is that appellate court judges tend to actually adhere to independence. They actually tend to vote sincerely. Notice again, it is a diametric opposed profile of legislation. So let me go to the next slide. This is a recent case. I wrote an op-ed on this case, no joke, the day I was leaving for New Zealand. This is true. The Supreme Court decides this case. In 2008, the Supreme Court decided that, that this peculiar, yeah, John? Yeah, of course, the Supreme Court doesn't split, right? The Supreme Court can, uh, can Well, yes and no, yes and no. It turns out that the docket control that the Supreme Court has is more illusory than it first appears. What John's referring to is absolutely right. The United States Supreme Court, like the House of Lords um, in England, has nominal docket control. There, isn't a, there used to be mandatory dockets, and then it was whittled down, and then in 1988 it was eliminated. The Supreme Court decides its docket in addition to deciding the cases on its docket. And the Supreme Court decides its docket through a convention called the Rule of Four. If four members of our nine justice court vote to grant a petition, to grant cert, after a petition for writ of certiorari has been filed, the court will take the, uh, will take the case. So John is saying that actually there isn't an obligation to decide cases because the court, in fact, doesn't have to take any case. Yes and no. The reason why it's yes and no is because although nominally it's true that the court doesn't have to take cases, as a practical matter, it does. Because what, what the Supreme Court cannot live with is splits on questions of federal law, either at the level of the states or at the level of uh, of, of federal circuits. And as a result, and this gets to other work I've done, what you really need to do is think about the relationship between the court's justiciability doctrines, which I can't do now, the standing rules, mootness, ripeness, and the like, and the cert rules. But for purposes of this paper, I just, that's another paper for another day. We can have a conversation about it, but it would just be too hard to unpack it for the benefit. You would understand the context, but it's just not worth doing the work right now. 
Um, so we, we, can think of the, we can think of the U.S. Supreme Court as having rules like the rules of courts with mandatory dockets, but I can get around the non-mandatory aspect, but it just requires more lifting to explain the background. So here's what happens. In 2008, the Supreme Court decides a case that takes the Second Amendment, uh, which has a clause saying that the, um, the you know, the, that, that free people have to have the right to, uh, have to have a mil the ability to form a militia, uh, the right of the people to, to, to bear arms shall not be infringed. Big question of whether that's an individual right to bear arms or whether that's a right associated with state militias. And back in the 1930s, there was a case that said it's not an individual right. 2008 comes along, we have a more conservative court, and the Supreme Court uh, essentially reverses itself and says it's an individual right for purposes of federal restrictions on the right to own guns. So, the 2008 case, which involves the DC, uh, which involves the District of Columbia, which is federal for these purposes, holds. The federal government can't restrict the right of an individual to own guns. This case, by the way, was brought by a former student of mine, a guy named Bob Levy, who was at the Cato Institute. Um, it's all about George Mason at the end of the day. Okay, <laughs> so uh, in any event, and I say that as a member of the faculty in Maryland, but what can I do? All right, so um, 2010, literally, the day before I'm leaving for New Zealand, the Supreme Court resolves a case about whether the Heller ruling applies to the city of Chicago. And we have this arcane doctrine in the United States called incorporation, which basically says rights that apply to the federal government under the Bill of Rights will apply to the states through this clause in the 14th Amendment called the Due Process Clause. And the question in the case everybody thought was, does the Second Amendment get incorporated to apply against the states and cities? But uh, it turns out things were not as pretty as people thought. Um, because the, what the Supreme Court did in this case was it badly fractured, it didn't issue a majority opinion, it issued five separate opinions, and in the course of that, a second issue emerges uh, as well. It had been brief, but nobody really thought it was serious, with one exception, his name is Clarence Thomas. Um, and that was that in 1868, the Supreme Court had decided a case called the Slaughterhouse Cases, which took another clause from the same amendment called the Privileges or Immunities Clause and construed it in a way that was roughly equivalent to taking your whiteout tape over the Constitution and just whiting out that part, right? So you had this language in the 14th Amendment that said that states can't infringe privileges and immunities, so the Slaughterhouse Cases, basically the court took whiteout and just whited out that part. They read it out of the Constitution for all intents and purposes. And everybody understood that 150 years later, we're not revisiting that with the exception of Clarence Thomas, who took the following view. Well, let me come back to him in a minute. Alito, uh, a Bush appointee, plus three, so the, core four, the four core conservatives on the court, say, this is silly, we're not going to resurrect privileges and immunities, privileges or immunities 150 years later, but we do think this should be incorporated under the Due Process Clause. Thomas says, Slaughterhouse Cases was wrong, um, so this should actually be treated as a privilege or immunity. The due process cases are all wrong too because the due process means process, not substance. This is substance, not process. Um, and so he says, I'm going to rule in favor of, uh, of, of McDonald, who wants the gun, uh, based on privileges or immunities, whereas Alito says, I'm going to rule in favor of McDonald based on due process and reject privileges and immunities, Thomas rejecting uh, due process. Breyer, for a liberal cohort of four justices, rejects both. He says, a plague on both your houses. This is neither a due process right nor a privileges or, privileges or immunities right. So what's sort of interesting about this case is if any individual justice said the following, it would not wash. If I said, if I were, if I were a justice, I believe that there is no due process right here. I believe there's no privileges or immunities right here. And yet I think this person's right needs to be honored. Nobody would buy that. That would be equivalent to preferring coffee to chocolate to vanilla to vanilla to coffee. It just is internally incoherent. And what this demonstrates is, well, look, you know, the court's a collective institution. As a court, the court has rejected privileges or immunities. Three plus three is six. I told you, you need to be able to add to do public choice. Three plus three is six justices. Are, I'm sorry, four plus four. I can't add. Four plus four, I, I shouldn't be doing public choice. Four plus four is eight. Eight out of nine justices reject privileges or immunities. The only one who doesn't is Thomas. Um, four plus one, five, reject due process. So the court rejects each ground and yet rules in favor of McDonald. And the reason is that we've got this bizarre coalition 
um, which is a non-coalition, really, of Alito plus Thomas taking opposite views on both dispositive issues, right? One says, yes, due process, no privileges or immunities. The other one says, yes, privileges or immunities, no due process. They both come out in favor of McDonald. I refer to this as, a, 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 as multidimensionality and asymmetry. Asymmetry meaning that although they have opposite issue resolutions that get to the same place, this camp has one issue in favor of each side that gets to the opposite place. I'm not going to formalize it for you, but I can make reasonable assumptions to show a cycle here. It's quite possible that, the, you know, that, that, that we could either, I could construct a forward or reverse cycle, uh, which demonstrates that no matter what the court does, uh, some majority is going to be thwarted in this case. And in this case, the majority that thinks both issues have been wrongly decided gets thwarted. The critical point is that the court doesn't rule that way. It doesn't rule based upon the internal logic of the opinion. Rather, it puts to an odd number of justices a binary choice. And that's a non condorcet rule. The choice is affirm or reverse. You'll get an outcome. Odd number of people, two choices, you get an outcome, but it's a non condorcet outcome. And this is an example in which that occurs. Now, that's a range-restricted rule. It doesn't mean you always end up in an impasse and a mess. This is a famous case from 1992 involving abortion rights. In 1973, the United States Supreme Court decided Roe versus Wade, which says there's a fundamental right to have an abortion. Um, in 1992, so 73 to 92, 19 years later, the, the balance on the court was so so, so favorable to Republicans, seven out of the nine justices had been appointed by Republican <coughs> presidents, um, that this was, the time was ripe for conservatives to challenge Roe versus Wade. There had been a bunch of efforts, but this was the pay dirt case. They go before the Supreme Court and the questions are twofold. One, um, can Roe v. Wade be overturned? And two, whatever the outcome of that question is, will the Pennsylvania restrictions on abortion be sustained? Um, and so what happens is, as in McDonald, there's no majority opinion. Uh, the court fractures. This is a slight oversimplification. There are more opinions than three, but it's consistent with the opinions that are written. And we end up with three basic factions <laughs> here. Rehnquist, Scalia, White, and Thomas. We can think of them as the conservatives, although in the case of White, uh, he is uh, his own man. Um, they say, let's overturn Roe and let's sustain all of the restrictive provisions of, uh, row, uh, of the Pennsylvania statute. Um, Stevens and Blackman are sort of the core liberals here. They say, let's uphold Roe and strike down all the restrictive provisions. Of course, they're going to uphold the one provision, which is an exception to the restrictive provisions for medical emergencies. And then we have O'Connor, Kennedy, and Souter, uh, the ones who are our moderates. And the moderates say, well, you know, we're not going to overturn Roe, but that's not going to prevent us from rewriting Roe. So we're going to rewrite Roe. And based on our rewritten Roe, we're going to sustain all the provisions except for one. And that provision was kind of interesting. It said that a uh, wife had to notify her husband before having an abortion. And they regarded that as demeaning, and so they struck that one down. Um, and what the court has done, now, now here's the thing, you've got two issues. One involving whether you keep or ditch Roe. The second involving what to do with the Pennsylvania statute. And yet, unlike the prior case, these two issues collapse into a single issue dimension for social choice purposes, which is a narrow to a broad right to abort. And in effect, what the, what the Supreme Court has done is it has said, that when you have no majority opinion, choose the opinion that has the least impact on the law. The formal name of the rule is the narrowest grounds rule. So choose the opinions consistent with the outcome that resolve the case on the narrowest grounds. And the way that works here is very simple. Of the opinions that actually strike down parts of the Pennsylvania statute, this one's narrower because it would strike fewer provisions. Right. They struck one, the rest of them would strike all, except the medical emergency. Of the, of the opinions that sustain parts of the Pennsylvania law, this one's narrower. Because these folks would sustain everything, they sustain everything but one. So in effect, what you end up with is a set of rules that ultimately devolves to the median member of the court. In effect, the narrowest grounds rule is Condorcet's rule applied to fractured panel cases. Right. It basically operates in the assumption that if we call this A, this B, and this C, the preferences are A, B, C, C, B, A, and we don't care about the second and third choice of B. Either way, B is the Condorcet winner. It beats A, it beats C. It's a Condorcet winner. The Supreme Court doesn't know about Condorcet, uh, but they, no, I don't, well, maybe, maybe Breyer does. Uh, maybe Breyer does. But nonetheless, I mean, they know about Condorcet, but they don't know about Condorcet in this context. 
text. They know about him as a historical figure, but they don't know about the conversation. No, no, because uh, Scalia bases his whole rejection of um, legislative history on it. Yeah, on cycling, yeah, I guess you're right. I, I guess that's true. So, so we'll, we'll, throw, we'll say Scalia and Breyer probably do both know about that. That's a fair point. Um, nonetheless, the point is that the rule is Condorcet's rule. The problem is that Condorcet's rule doesn't always work, right? So if you go back to this one, there is no Condorcet winner. There just isn't one. Uh, and I can demonstrate that more formally, but there isn't. Now, um, and it also favors the median outcome, as you can see. Now, this, I don't have a huge amount of time here, but let me just cut to the chase on this. The phenomenon of cycling within cases isn't limited to individual cases. It can also occur with groups of cases over time. It turns out that in these two cases, and I'm just going to quickly walk you through this, we have two cases involving constitutional rules at the state level to restrict integrative busing. In this case, the Supreme Court strikes down the California rule. Here, I'm sorry, they, they sustain a California rule, they strike down a Washington state rule. But if you look at the, ju in, in these two cases are decided the same day. If you line up the votes, what you discover is that the justices with asterisks next to their names, so Powell, Berger, Rehnquist, O'Connor in the majority, here in dissent, Marshall in dissent, here in the majority, in their separate opinions, they make clear that they think the cases are indistinguishable. What's cool about that is that there are three majorities. One, uphold the California statute, a, amendment. Two, strike down the Washington one. Three, treat them the same way. Obviously those are not, you can't satisfy all three majorities. It's possible to demonstrate that there's an embedded cycle in these outcomes. In the actual case, the thwarted majority is the crossover majority that would treat the cases as indistinguishable. But, if, but think of it this way. Here's the cool thing about the stare decisis rule. If the cases came up a year apart and these folks voted sincerely, which is a, which is a, a contestable assumption, but, but it's interesting to think about. If the Crawford case comes up first, the majority upholds it. If Washington comes up second, the majority that thinks the cases are indistinguishable should restrict their domain. They should ask, does Crawford govern Seattle? In which case they uphold that one too. Flip it around. If Seattle comes up first, majority strikes it down. If the majority that thinks that they're indistinguishable votes sincerely, they'll strike that down. And so what you end up with is a path-dependent, consistent set of rulings based on stare decisis, conceivably. That's not to say that they won't, that they will vote sincerely, but if they do, you end up with that result. So the end product of all of this is that the court is obligated to decide cases and, and when I say the court, I mean appellate courts generally, it does so by using range-restricted rules. In individual cases, outcome voting is a range-restricted rule. Over groups of cases over time, stare decisis is a range-restricted rule. Stare decisis, just one, one sec, stare decisis equals reduce the number of binary comparisons by one relative to options. When it applies, it disallows consideration of how you would resolve case two absent a precedent. And so it's for n options, n minus one votes. Stare decisis equals range-restricted rule, and moreover, um, as a general matter, the justices do not have an incentive to depart from sincerely held views because they will locate the median away from their preferred ideal point. So it's exactly the opposite profile of legislatures. Whereas legislatures adhere to range and relax independence, appellate courts adhere to independence but relax range. Please, Shana. I'm assuming that justices tend to vote consistently with their expressed sincere views, whatever they are. And not all of the justices will answer that question the same way. But if they don't adhere to stare decisis as a governing principle, then the cycle merely embeds itself in a different fashion. Because the way the, uh, the, way the Supreme Court tends to work is it disfavors overruling in favor of distinctions. So what ends up happening is you create a path-dependent product as a result of disingenuous efforts to distinguish obviously governing precedents. And I could regale you with numerous examples of that. So the point is that, that's why I said I'm not assuming they necessarily wouldn't devise a distinction if they came up a year apart. I'm saying let's suspend our disbelief for a minute and assume that to be true. But if in fact they don't, it's simply going to manifest itself in another form which is consistent with what you sort of predict using social choice. It, it's like a balloon. Squeeze one side, the air goes somewhere else, right? And that's just invariably the way it's going to work. 
So, okay, so let me now cut to the, 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 the whole point of all of this, which is what's the social choice profile of direct democracy? Here's the key point. Balloted plebiscites produce an outcome. You're going to either approve it or you're going to reject it, and that's going to be true regardless of whether the preference structure cycles, and we're going to see whether that's possible, uh, and regardless of preference intensities. Right? You will get an outcome. It is a range-restricted rule. Two, plebiscite voters are not motivated to depart from sincerely held views for a bunch of reasons. Number one, agreements to vote in sincerely are not enforceable and, in fact, are legally prohibited. Uh, number two, as in the judicial context, voting against your sincerely held views will tend to move policy away from your ideal point rather than toward your ideal point. And number three, the consequence is to favor the Condorcet winning or median outcome within plebiscites. As a result, the profile of direct democracy is, huh, relaxed range adheres to independence. Gee, turns out that's the same as appellate courts. Let me illustrate that rather than just posit it. Imagine that we have a policy dimension uh, one through nine, liberals one, conservatives to nine. One of the things that Cooser and McCubbin suggest is that um, you end up with extreme moves on policy that may thwart the median voter. I think they're wrong. Um, let's assume we're at position one and there's a plebiscite at three. As between one and three, a majority of voters will approve it. That gets you closer to the median. Let's assume instead we go from one to seven. That's clearly an extreme move, except seven's closer to the median voter than one. Right? So there's a good chance that you'll approve it. So the idea is that you are moving in the direction of the median voter, even if you end up with fairly dramatic policy shifts. Now, Cooser and McCubbins present this somewhat differently. They believe that systematically plebiscites are prone to cycles. I think they may be right, but I think they don't have the mechanism right. What they present here, and this is, all, this is from their article, are three people or three groups of people, any two of whom satisfies a majority. And they have preferences. Q is status quo. They're basically positing a reverse cycle, CBA, ACB, BAC. It's a reverse cycle as opposed to a forward cycle with Q interspersed in the ordinal rankings. The formalization of the cycle is A defeats Q, B defeats A, C defeats B, Q defeats C. The cycle is C, P, B, P, A, P, Q, P, C. It's a reverse cycle. That's, the, that's their slide, right? It would have been helpful if they had simply said that, but that's what they are showing. And here's what they said. They say, in 1990, the citizens of Oregon, this is out of their article, the citizens of Oregon, wh when do I, do I have till 4.30? Okay, good, because I do want to get through this. This is sort of a, a neat point. The citizens of Oregon passed an initiative uh, that sought to reduce property taxes and then in 1996 passed another measure that limited the revenue available for schools and other services that had been funded by property taxes. Just four years later, in 2000, citizens passed an initiative that established a sufficiency standard for funding based on the Oregon quality education model that required a significant increase in state funding, spending on education. It's easy to see that following multiple ballot measures to reduce taxes with one that instructs the legislature to increase spending may be mutually inconsistent. Similarly contradictory initiatives occurred in Massachusetts, for example, in 1982. Citizens voted to restrict radioactive waste disposal, then in 88, failed to ban the electric power plants producing such waste. Needless to say, citizens in these two time periods passed measures that were largely at odds with each other, with the 1988 result perpetuating the 1982 problem. The above anecdotes suggest the theoretical problems of sequential elimination agendas have an empirical and basis in the initiative process. What they're saying is that this story is this story. I think they're wrong. I think their story is this story, that we have a move from one side to the other side that may get you closer to the median. What I mean by that is we have inconsistent results. That's for sure. But nothing in the plebiscites of its own force precludes voter regret, just like buyer's regret. I give the example in the paper, you know, you might buy a car, you might decide a year later, gee, that was a bad decision, you might even sell it at a loss, it's expensive, buyer's regret's not fun, but it's not irrational. It happens to people all the time. And there's no reason why if it happens to people, it can't happen to voters. They have buyer's regret. They bought a policy, they didn't like it, and so they retracted the policy, moving it closer to the median voter position. I don't think they've demonstrated a cycle, but I do think it's possible to have a cycle but I don't think this is the most interesting example of a cycle. So there are two levels of cycling. One is cycling at the level of substantive policy, and the second is over institutional choice mechanism. Before you get to that, right? Yeah. You know, it's not a strong empirical test, but, but if, uh, if Matt's right, we should see this happening again and again. Right. 
you're at, we try to... It stabilizes. Yeah, I agree with you. And so if yeah. you look, you know, California is more like you, Florida is more like Matt McCubbin. Right. Yeah, no, you're, you're, let, me, let me be clear. I am not suggesting that what they've demonstrated couldn't be, couldn't be a segment of information that would lead to a cycle if we had more data. I'm saying they haven't proved a cycle. And I can, and I can reconcile their data with unidimensional. If the default position for social choice, which I think it should be, is it is better to assume no cycles in, unless you prove otherwise. Right? That's the safer default position. I don't think they've made their case. I don't think they've made their case. Now, it's not possible. That doesn't mean that their case couldn't be made with more data, but this data doesn't prove it. That, that's all. And you're right. A way to falsify either their thesis or my reaction to their thesis is to see if we end up with perpetual swings, which might demonstrate that there's another dimension going on here. But, but they haven't shown that. That's all I'm saying. Okay. So, so here's an alternative in which over policy you might end up with a cycle, but I want to be clear. This is not, to me, the really interesting point. But it is interesting enough because it shows that you could have a, a, a cycle. So here's the example. You can imagine a vote to have a casino, uh, and you can imagine a second vote after the casino passes um, that in, in, in there are commitments made based upon the expected revenue stream tax-wise from the casino to actually relax residential zoning laws to allow secondary businesses that will support the casino without which the, z the casino will not fail. If there aren't restaurants nearby and other supporting businesses, the casino as a freestanding institution might not fail, I mean, might not succeed. You could imagine that if P1 passes, some of those who initially oppose P1 might nonetheless support P2 um, because of subsequent funding commitments that they care about even though they didn't like the casino in the first place. Conversely, you can imagine if P2 came up first and it failed initially, P2 meaning plebiscite 2, some of those who initially wanted the casino might then vote against it because they say, well, without these supportive businesses, the casino is going to fail. And so what we have is essentially a sequential elimination agenda. It's possible, in effect, that the bonded commitments of either disallowing supportive secondary businesses or committing to the casino and committing to the tax revenues shapes the votes of some members enough to tip the second plebiscite. And you could formalize it into uh, essentially a simple path dependence story with cycling preferences. But that's the basic idea. It, but notice that the result is coherent but path dependent, unlike their examples. Their examples are claimed incoherence, back and forth. But that's along a single dimensional scale. Here you end up with opposite policy. It's exactly like Crawford and, Crawford and Seattle. You get opposite results depending on ordering, but either of the results is internally coherent, it's just path dependent, right? So, that, so in other words, what I'm saying is that the bonded commitment plays the role of stare decisis. For some voters, it restricts their domain in the second round, but I don't think that's interesting. I mean, it's interesting, but it's not the key point. I think the more interesting point is that there are cycling possibilities when we think about expanding the dimensionality to include not just the substantive policy, but the institutional choice mechanism. So let's start with a simple example. Imagine that we have a, uh, a proposal to change some state of the law. The example I give in the paper is to eliminate race-based affirmative action in the United States schools, and so, I mean in, in some state set of state, state schools. Liberals say, no, we want to preserve the status quo. Conservatives say, yes, we want to enact this strong form initiative. Moderate voters want something in the middle. Single dimensional scale, strong opposition to strong support of a conservative preferred policy. Easy enough, right? And then how that turns out is going to turn on whether the moderate voters support the initiative or not. Okay. But let's imagine instead that we put to the voters a couple, uh, put to the voters a different question. You get to vote on whether you want the policy change embedded in the initiative or not, but you also get to vote on whether you want to isolate the policy for a plebiscite or throw it to the legislature to conjoin it with the whole range of policies over which legislators duke it out routinely, warts and all. You might end up with a moderate policy, right, combined with other issues. What is the consequence of that? And in the paper I explain how you could, oops, I'm sorry, how you could come up with reasonable assumptions that give you a forward or reverse cycle. And we could get to this the same way by having our position C actually prefer to conjoin the policy but oppose a change at the legislature. These are the two possibilities, right? We have to have a group that wants to, to, to actually enact the initiative and we have to have a group that wants to have a moderated version through the legislative process. This is optional. 
It could be that those who are opposing it want to conjoin it, I'm sorry, want to isolate it, or they want to conjoin it. The critical point is that direct democracy, direct democracy is a range restricted rule. It doesn't allow the choice over the multiple dimensions necessary to determine not just what the policy outcome should be along an isolated issue dimension, but whether the policy should be resolved along an isolated issue dimension. That's the range restriction. I believe fundamentally that direct democracy is anti-democratic. Let me be clear about that, however. I am not casting aspersions by saying that. That's the descriptive account. It's anti-democratic. It simply is anti-democratic if you define democratic <laughs> as the ability to use the filtering mechanisms of democratic representational processes to actually put all the issues into the hopper and duke it out. It is anti-democratic if you say, we don't care whether you would like this decision to be made now or not. It will be made now without regard to intensities of preference, without regard to the possibility that if we actually took full dimensionality into account, would actually have a cycle. And so what I'm arguing is that when we recognize that the profile of direct democracy is anti-democratic, restricting the range of choice in the legislative process, it has potential implications for the range of decisions that we may want to either leave in the legislative process or throw out to direct democracy that are simply not accounted for adequately in the literature. The supposition among those who support direct democracy is if a majority of voters want the policy, that's democratic. But that's a false premise. The reason it's a false premise is because it fails to consider <coughs> the possibility that a majority of voters would simply prefer to allow this to be duped out with other issues in a way that legitimates outcomes, even outcomes that people find frustrating, right? Kind of goes back to Churchill. Democracy sucks, except in comparison to everything that sucks more, right? And so that's the argument. And at the end of the paper, I talk about policy implications. I could go through this. A lot of this is fairly American content, so I can answer questions about it if you'd like. But the main point that I try to make here is that, in effect, a lot of the peculiar Supreme Court cases that involve direct democracy just look otherworldly. The Supreme Court says this, but does that. It says that there's no distinction, but then distinguishes. And what I'm suggesting is that it might be the case that intuitively some of the members of the court see that there's something problematic going on. And it may be more problematic in the context of initiatives than referendums. Because referendums, unlike initiatives, go through all the veto gates in the legislative process. They do allow members to register intensities of preference, but they allow the electorate to veto the policy. Unlike initiatives, which simply strip from the legislature the particular policy question along an isolated dimension, disallow the registration of intensities of preference along that issue dimension at the various veto gates, and thereby anti-democratically force a resolution of an issue that the voters may simply not want, not want to have resolved, but don't have a choice. It will be resolved. So they may as well sincerely express their views. And the point that I'm trying to make is this. Typically, we think of legislatures as more democratic than judges because legislators are elected, judges are appointed. But I think that oversimplifies things. I think what really makes legislators, legislatures representative and appellate courts non representative or non-democratic is that legislatures have the wherewithal not only to decide substantive issues of policy, they also have the wherewithal to decide not to decide substantive issues of policy. Courts do not. And it's anti-democratic to force decisions to be made rather than to allow consideration of when you want the decisions to be made. And that's why, counterintuitively, I argue Direct democracy is direct anti-democracy. Thank you. Please. Is an issue as used anywhere outside of the United States? <sighs> you know, it's interesting. There is an initiative process in Sweden, but it is not our initiative process. It's an initiative process that then throws, it forces consideration of the issue in the legislature. There's also a referendum process that goes in the opposite direction. 
So if you're asking, is there an initiative process in which a minority of voters gets a requisite number of signatures? In Sweden, it happens to be 100,000. I don't know what the percentage is in California. It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And then actually can force a binary vote um, with no, no involvement by the legislature. I have to confess, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I've, I've had enough to figure out what's going on in this literature and in the United States, but it's a question I'm interested in the answer to. Do you know the answer? Okay. Okay. I would assume nothing less from you. How would you pigeonhole the election markets with this campaign during if you were in dark space? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I, 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 look, I have to say, I haven't done the international expedition. I've had enough to do to do the domestic one. Um, so I really, I'm, I'm, I'm not as prepared to answer that question. But it is, it, that's sort of the next stage, right? Is to say, okay, now I have these intuitions. How does it work in other parts of the world, right? Are there, sort of, as we look around the globe and we see institutions that resemble direct democracy in some form, is the default position one that completely cuts out the legislature like the U.S. states, 24 that have it, or do they filter through some legislative process in the first instance or force filtering uh, in the case that I've just described? That would be an interesting question because that might inform something about perceptions of democratic decision making. But I don't have the data. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, please, James. What works better? I, I, th I have more, look, here's my view. Referendas, referendums cut the governor out, in who, who would otherwise have veto power, and in place of the governor put the electorate, give the electorate veto power. There may be reasons why you would prefer the governor to have veto power over the electorate because the governor is a venue at which different interest groups can converge and actually negotiate, whereas the electorate they can't. But you've still allowed all the other veto gates. So it's magnitudes of difference better than initiatives, in my opinion. Initiatives cut the legislature and the governor out of the deal. I find that to be profoundly anti-democratic. No, 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 look, uh, you're not going to get an argument from me on that. I mean, so, and, and let me just say, according to John Matsusaka, it's referendums, not referenda under OED because referendum was not a word that existed. Well, yeah, anyway, so according to Oxford English Dictionary, it's referendums. Okay. I, I still have two fifty-two five That's okay, and I'm with you on that. Right. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, no, but that happens all, I mean, this happens all the time. This is the confusion point. I mean, there was, there was a, a, a terrific illustration of that involving same-sex marriage laws. I, I, I think it was in Maine, with, where, where, the, where the initiative was so confusing. I mean, I read it multiple times, and I couldn't make head nor tails out of it. Julian Yule, who um, unfortunately died at a young age, he was a, he was a UCLA law professor, 
um, who I only discovered when I was doing this research, tells the story about moving to California to be, you know, people tell him about all the, the life changes from an East Coast to West Coast life and how those things were no problem for him, but the process of direct democracy blew him away. I mean, he, he would get these mailings, these massive mailings with these initiatives, and he said, geez, if I as a law professor can't make head or tails out of this, how are people who don't do this for a living going to make it? And not only is he a law professor, but he's a law professor who's interested in referendums, right? And he couldn't figure out what this stuff is about. I mean, I, you know, the other aspect of referendums being better but still not being great is that there actually is something to the notion that legislators actually know how to legislate. Right? We, we, you know, in the U.S. we have this idea, I mean, it's this, this sort of this anti-elitist mentality that, you know, really just, you know, take people off the street and throw them in Congress and take people in Congress and throw them in jail. But the fact of the matter is that, that you know, there actually is a skill set here, right? I mean, it actually turns out to be the case that this is not knowledge with which we are born, right? We actually have to learn how to draft things to avoid fundamental problems. And at least going through the legislative process in the first instance reduces the likelihood that what you've passed is gibberish. It doesn't eliminate the likelihood. I mean, it doesn't eliminate it altogether. I can give you examples of federal statutes that are gibberish. But they're relatively fewer than initiatives that are gibberish. I, I, you know, I wouldn't accuse anybody of, d despite what I say about social choice, I, th there are limits to my willingness to accuse people of internal consistency. I'll just leave it at that. No, the answer to that question is the people who write on corporations don't write on this stuff. Yeah, well, that's right. But there are plenty of people in the you know, Sleepwork Academy, which are just very interested with the idea and how to articulate Yeah, actually, some of them are my faculty. Yeah. But they don't write about this stuff. Yeah. So well, not that extreme, but in softer form. Yeah, please go ahead. A, a positive empirical factor, a reproducing subjective truth, and I, I don't know for sure. If we look over you know, US history, um, the states in the period that have had lots of initiatives in general are states that attract residents, are states that have high housing values, so planting, gravity, environmental. Right. I don't know what to infer from that. I mean, one possibility <laughs> is that when you have sort of uneven wealth to poor distributions in a community, the, the, sort of the, the, <laughs> the folks who are wealthy want to entrench regimes that limit the ability to tax the hell out of them, right? So you end up with things like, you, you want to make sure that, well, actually, it's the opposite story in California. If you look at Prop 13, what you're really doing is not protecting the real wealthy. What you're doing there is protecting people that live in homes, the assessed values of which would actually force them out of their homes if they actually were called upon to pay taxes based upon fair market value. So actually, that's counter to my story. You know, I don't know. What, I, what, do you, what would you draw from the data? I mean, I'm, what, is the, what, is the, what inference are you suggesting? Maybe I'm missing it. Yeah, I agree that I agree with that, but I'd like to know what you what what is it specifically you think that the thinking should lead me. Right. In the direction that people at least are willing to pay for a say. Right. So the inference that people in favor of democracy is probably one that we shouldn't be drawing. I'm not saying I hope you don't misunderstand me to say that people don't give a shit about democracy. I actually think that talk is suggesting the opposite, no, no, that these true. folks aren't given the opportunity to decide so whether they want democratic versus non-democratic decisions to make the decision. That is caring about democracy. True, people care about democracy, they should, you know, historically have been leaving California or leaving Florida. Oh, or oh, the Tibu stuff. I mean, I guess, I mean, you and I had this conversation in the hallway. I mean, I'm just a little less inclined to imagine that those who are disadvantaged by these sorts of plebiscites uh, that operate to the detriment of, you know, sort of poor folks, uh, minorities, and the like, um, have the wherewithal to up and move based upon adverse. The, the idea that large numbers of, uh, you know, of folks would leave because they've suffered a defeat in a plebiscite, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, theory to me in that case is outstripping reality by a significant margin. Oh, I disagree with that. 
I mean, I, I, I just disagree with that. I, I, I don't think that the fact that people are not so upset, that, or, 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 or I shouldn't say so upset, that they're able to move in response to an adverse plebiscite means that the plebiscite's not important. I, uh, quite the contrary, they're trapped, right? In other words, I, I, think that, I, I think that what you've got is a regime in which a lot of people would like to register their intensities, but the vehicle through which the policy decision was made. I mean, one, 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 one piece of the story that I get, one of the reasons why this troubles me is, you could imagine that there is a proposal to eliminate or end race-based preferences, and that this is negotiated through the California General Assembly, Assembly, and they strike a deal that they're not gonna do this in exchange, or, or, or they're gonna phase it out in exchange for some other payment that, I don't know, African American voters have been willing to acquiesce on some other set of issues, right? That you've got to phase out in exchange for something else, but then it goes to plebiscite and there's a more extreme policy enacted and the payoff to these minority voters has been taken away from them. I mean, think about why we call judicial review anti-democratic. It's because legislatures enact policies and we don't know what all of the dimensions of negotiations were prior to that thing becoming a law. But we do know that a piece of it gets taken out. And have, had they known in advance the piece would be taken out, the deal would have been struck differently. And it's the exact same thing you with direct they democracy. Don't, they don't count as an issue. Well, I mean, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, uh, if you really believe that. I mean, I, I, I think an economist can believe, okay, I believe probabilistically that there's X percent chance that this deal I'm striking will be undone by the electorate. And maybe over time that occurs. But, you know, I mean, I think people have a greater confidence in democratic institutions when payoffs are honored than when they're reneged, right? I mean, part of what I'm concerned with is legitimacy. I think what makes democratic decision making legitimate is that people assume that they get in there, it's a rough and tumble, brutal world, you get in there, you fight your best, and when you win, you won. And I, I you know, I mean, I, just, I think that's it. And that we limit the domain of institutions undoing those victories. Constitutional judicial review is an example, but that's grounded in principles of law. Direct democracy is not. It's grounded in principles of majority preferences, and that's different. That's all I'm saying. I just don't know that I agree with you, John, though, that people can systematically up and out, and that the failure to do that means that they don't care about these issues. Well, but, okay, let's, let's put some boundaries. And you have people who vote often, right? And you, you, know, you, you change taxes by 50 basis points whole lot of people. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. If, if, if you tripled their taxes, they'd move. And, the fa and I suppose you can infer from the fact that these policies pass without them moving to mean that they care less about this than having their taxes bankrupt them. Okay, I'll agree with you on that. But I guess I'm not willing to agree with you that that makes this trivial in the sense that they don't care about it in a way that matters. I still think it compromises the legitimacy of legislative decision making when deals are reneged based purely on preference. That's the point I'm trying to make. We're probably right at yeah, I'm sorry, I know. We're we're still still but, but John had a question I didn't get to. Oh. Go, um, if, can, I, can I do that? Or? Yeah, just, 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 just quick, right? I mean, my, the critical mass is this. I, I'm trying to sort of just see this sort of historic framework and saying let's look at these institutions and what the logical extension of the yeah. choice is, right? And so, uh, I mean, uh, the critical mass that I'm getting at is, is uh, legislative, legislative institution is uh, functioning democratically because it denies its uh, independence of alternatives, takes into account preference issues, there's a, there's a there's specialization you talked about, the information income from all the different interest groups, and it may be created to not make a decision. Yes, that being the critical one. Yeah, but I'm just saying from, from the big picture point, I'm wondering if, if, if our ignorance about the drafting of the referenda, referendum or, or the initiative, the drafting process where like your ambiguous one is that it, it went through so much conflict and things are so ambiguous that nobody or confusing and nobody really knows what it is, so a non decision is made. Yeah, except for the fact that a lot of those non decisions end up being affirmative decisions and that's the problem. Uh, yeah, but then they that's an empirical question. They've got to be implemented somehow in the right. institution. Yeah. I'm just saying maybe that, that drafting process is a way you know, like the more complex and in fairness, and in fairness, there is some literature that suggests that draft, it's not like a first draft gets valid. And, and I, I'll concede that point. That just might be a good yeah, no, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a very good thought. Anyways, I didn't want to hold over, but he had his hand up for a while, and I wanted to at least. Sorry about that. Thank you all.